Did anybody in here submit Project 3? Sorry? Oh, just kidding. I mean, I can see there are people who didn't submit Project 3. All right, well, that's cool. So at 12.01 this morning, the late version of Project 3 should have become available. And um, if you're one of the people who can see both of them, submit to the not, not um, late one. There's a couple of people who had issues that they got extensions for. I pushed up pretty hard for people not to extend that because I don't want you to steal time from Project 4 to do more on Project 3. Project 4 is actually harder, but much more useful than Project 3. Project 3, we know there are a lot of weaknesses. We know there are things in Project 3 that, and, and it came up in conversations on, on Discord and, and a little bit on Piazza. Actually, I think Discord is more active than Piazza is. Um, but there are conversations where people are like, well, but what, what about these cases? What about that? And you begin to realize Project 3 isn't actually a very good solution. You know, when you first look at it, you go, okay, great, I've got data replication. How, how cool is that? And then you begin to look at the edge cases and the cases where things fail and how do I deal with this in instance? And I know I keep harping on this, but now I'm trying to reinforce that. The course is about handling failure. And I've given you this, this observation that this is an impossible to achieve goal. FLP says that in a very formal kind of way. I use humor because, of course, we've got the Vogons blowing up the Earth. That's the same thing. I cannot plan for that. Not yet. There are people who are working on being able to solve this. We will probably at some point have data centers on the moon. Well, the Vogons wiping out the solar system would, would probably negate that. But I have a hard time worrying about that particular failure case. I mean, in all seriousness, I don't know if you've ever known anybody who's like super afraid of nuclear war. You just ignore it. You can't plan for it. There's nothing you can do about it. Well, probably not. I actually did work with a guy um, at, at Georgia Tech. He was a student there, finished now. And he actually worked on nuclear weapons for the US. He was a an employee of the Air Force. He was not an enlisted member. He was actually just you know, a, an employee. And that was what he was working on, was modernization of their, the nuclear weapon system. And it was scary because they were stuck in a model where they couldn't upgrade anything. I mean, the last thing in the world you want to do is like upgrade the firmware on your keyboard and find out that suddenly it's sending spurious key commands. Right? They were very paranoid about that kind of stuff. That's where failure was, was not an option, where they had, they'd rather have things go wrong. You're not in that environment yet. Project 3 is not particularly good in terms of handling a broad range of failures. It handles a small number of failures. And then the use of an, a discrete event simulator makes you not realize that you could literally be, be simulating something that takes weeks or months to happen. I mean, like I, I tried to talk about how uh, the time that it takes for the primary to acknowledge the view change. The reason for that is because you want the primary to tell the rest of the world that we're now open for business with replication only when we have two in-sync replicas. How long does it take us to get our replicas in sync? Well, this is a little project in a discrete event simulator. We don't actually care about that. The real amount of time though, and my, my example was a one terabyte database, database. So if you have a one terabyte database and you have a one gigabit connection between the two servers, you're talking about 8,192 seconds to synchronize those. Holy moly, that's a lot of time. And that is 100% effective utilization of your network. Guess what? You're never going to get 100% effective utilization of your network, ever, because there's overhead. You're probably going to get maybe 80%. And that's actually really good. Put those things in different data centers, and now you're going to actually see that time go even longer. 
And that's just a terabyte. Moving data takes time. And I've made that point before as well. Moving data is one of the most expensive things we end up doing in distributed systems. That's why project three requires that the primary, because the primary is the only one that knows if the backup is currently in sync. We can't trust the backup, it doesn't know. The primary knows. The view server doesn't know. The view server is basically just almost completely useless. It is a configuration server and that's it. But this model is one that we're going to see again. But before we do that, we'll do the usual logistics stuff. Uh, let's see, so, uh, so project three, the late deadline is April 13th. Um, there were a couple of concession cases and those people have a little bit more time to work on it. Uh, for those of you who didn't make the deadline last night at 11.59 p.m., there is a late version available. For those of you who did make the deadline last night, the late version is still available. Uh, whichever grade is highest is going to be used. Uh, I actually transferred the grades from Gradescope to Canvas, so you can see the grade on Canvas. Uh, if you have one of the concessions, then I'll update them when all the concessions are done. Uh, da, da, da. And the project reports actually have to be evaluated. I think next time I do this, I'm going to actually require two reports. A planning report in advance of the project, the actual code, and then the final. I've even considered just making the code not worth anything. Um, I took a, a machine learning class at Georgia Tech, and that's what it was. Is like uh, The instructor basically said, I don't care about your code at all. Feel your code, use other people's code, doesn't make any difference to me. The only thing they cared about was actually the anal analysis. And then somebody I know, because he was one of my students in uh, OS class, actually built an entire turnkey system for generating the report. And that they prohibited. Um, but it was very interesting because really the reason that I like to emphasize the report is because what you really, what I want you to come away from this understanding is how to think about these things. I don't care about that code. I don't care about the projects, the specifics, the details. I'm like, it's fun answering people's questions because it forces me to think about the way that it's working in your brain and how can I explain things more clearly. Uh, there's not much that's changed here. I did actually add the TA office hours on this slide. So if you have questions about the code, you can go torture the TAs. None of them have actually done the DS Labs projects. They did uh, different projects with, with Ivan. But they're, I don't know, has anybody talked to any of the TAs? Were they helpful? Interesting. I think so. Huh. Okay. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with that information, but I'll have to think about that. Uh, lots of things that you can actually read, and I've even got more links to more papers throughout the, the lecture. If you want to know more about what we're talking about, it's, it's very useful to read these things. So the primary source for today's lecture is, in fact, the part-time parliament. And it was kind of fun because it forced me to go to Les Leslie's uh, website. His, uh, uh, yeah, he's at Microsoft Research right now. And he's in his 70s, and he still actively does research. Um, he's a very interesting guy. Have any of you ever used LaTeX? That's his. Leslie Lamport did LaTeX. He didn't do tech. That was Donald Knuth. Um, anybody ever met Knuth? He was on the third floor. I was on the fourth floor at Stanford. And um, I ran into him a couple of times. Um, nicest academic I think I've ever actually met. Really tall, very skinny, and absolutely humble, which is unlike a lot of academics I've met. Uh, and very, very brilliant. I think he's still working on the art of computer programming, volume four, four something or other, B or C or D. The second link there is actually very interesting 
discussion. It's a blog post. It's a blog post about um, Google's Borg. And Borg is Google's implementation of uh, distributed management that uses Paxos. And Paxos is actively used. But one of the interesting things I read when I was looking at Lamport's website, and I was mentioning this earlier, is that he was at Digital Equipment Corporation in Palo Alto. So that's the, the city literally next to Stanford. So when you go to Stanford, you go through Palo Alto to get to Stanford normally. Um, and it's kind of like you know, going to Vancouver from here, right? It's literally next door. Um, and they had digital equipment had not one but two research facilities in Palo Alto. They're both gone. Lamport was at uh, the Systems Research Center in um, Palo Alto, and he wrote the paper on Paxos and he submitted it to ACM, and they rejected it. Actually, uh, same exact paper gets submitted eight years later, and it is accepted and published. But one of the interesting side effects of him submitting this thing and it not getting accepted, it, 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 he was kind of negative about the reviewers because they didn't quite get it. Um, was his goal in, in using this mythical Greek island was to try and divorce what's a very simple algorithm from the details of computers. He tried to put it into a different framework to try and make it easier for people, people to understand. And it either worked or it completely failed. It was totally bimodal. In the late 90s, there were a couple of people at, at uh, the Systems Research Center who were doing projects around storage. And they needed a, a consensus algorithm. And he showed them Paxos. And they apparently immediately got it and said, this is exactly what we want. And they then implemented it. And I actually didn't know that until last night when I was going through Leslie's um, website because I knew those projects, both of them, because they are involved in storage. And I have links to those later. Paxos is heavily used. Um, the Paxos and Computer Agreement is actually Heidi Howard. She's, she's awesome. She's one of the world's experts now in distributed consensus algorithms. And she's done, uh, her PhD was actually in ways of weakening some of the restrictions that you find in Paxos and in Raft. And she does a very interesting discussion about um, you know, which of these protocols are different. They are different. Paxos versus Raft are completely different. Raft versus view stamp replication, they're the same. The difference is that a couple of guys suggested Raft and um, uh, a woman and her grad student suggested view stamp replication. View stamp replication has actually been in use for a long time as well. And that's going to be next lecture. So I'm going to give you the two big protocols that we see used in distributed systems. And I'm going to start with Paxos, even though it was after view stamp replication and before Raft. I liked the, the blog post there, Understanding Paxos. And then for those of you who actually want to see an implementation of this, there is a very nice Paxos implementation, and you can look at it in Python, and there's even a Java code version of it. Um, it won't adapt super well to uh, the DS Labs framework, and I would suggest that you never have it open at the same time you have your editor open in your own code. That's just my advice. But the goal is for you to learn Paxos. Look at the Python implementation. You can have that one open while you're writing your, your Java code. And Cutting and pasting that won't do it. Just hang. Anybody have any questions at this point? Any funny stories? Ah, we've got a funny story. And I never initialized a timer to ping the view. My servers never pinging. 
I just had some convoluted system where they would like ping sometimes when they received client requests and I was passing so much stuff and it took like three days to figure out that I was missing one line of code to actually set a timer. Welcome to actual <laughs> programming. It, it definitely does seem to work that way. Sometimes where you, um, you, you, you get to that point where you look at the code and you go, how did this ever work at all? I have a t-shirt for that. It's the same face and one is, why doesn't this code work? And the other face is, why does this code work? And I've experienced both, for sure. So, cool. Yeah, and at least you started at least three days in advance. I noticed there were a fair number of people who started yesterday. Um, I really would strongly encourage you to start early on Paxos. Paxos grinds people up and spits them out. And it's not a complicated protocol, as you will see as we walk through it. But the devil is in the details. One line of code. Oh, gee, I never actually pinged the view server. Because you, you want to ping the view server when you need to, but not too often. Because if, uh, some people got slapped around for that one. Don't send a ping to the view server on every request, right? Because now you create a, a large overhead. And this is, again, a problem, right? The cost of communications. You do not want to add those kinds of overheads. I have a very short failure for today. Um, there's a company called Rackspace that had a, a Microsoft Exchange hosted mail service. If you're unfamiliar with Microsoft Exchange, it is what about 90% of the corporate world uses for uh, handling email these days. And it's really interesting because I know the people who built the early versions of this. I have a friend from high school who's worked at Microsoft on their mail system. In the days when Microsoft was running their mail system on an operating system of a Unix version called Xenix, which Microsoft actually built and sold and used. And that was before they had a direct connection. I don't think they had a direct connection to the internet at that point. They actually dialed up periodically to the University of Washington and downloaded their email. And uh, they, they had large queuing delays and whatnot, and he worked on that. And then they slowly they replaced that SMTP-based infrastructure with this project called Exchange. And it was a disaster. Total, absolute disaster. Now, it's what pretty much everybody runs. Um, Microsoft Exchange uses its own database. They tried at one point to move to Microsoft SQL Server, but in fact, it actually uses what's called the Jet Engine. Uh, I don't, have any of you ever used Microsoft Access? It's the same engine, except they've tweaked it just a bit. Um, so on December 2nd, 2022, Rackspace was subject to a ransomware attack. They literally were encrypting the databases that contained the emails of the clients of Rackspace. It wasn't a huge business for Rackspace, but it wasn't tiny. It was about $30 million a year. As far as I can tell, Rackspace is now officially out of the hosted exchange business. So this is the cost of a failure. Sometimes there's no recovery. And this is why you know, I talk about failure and I talk about handling failure. And what we try to do as much as possible is be able to automate that. In fact, this is one of the most common outcomes of a failure. It puts someone out of business. Ransomware attacks, if they are not recovered within numbers, kind of scary. It's like two weeks. The company usually fails. These are the kinds of failures that require manual intervention. So this is serious business. I mean, this is literally something that could make or break the company you work for. And... Literally, their, their mitigation, this is my favorite part, their mitigation was they told their customers to move to Microsoft's implementation of hosted exchange. That is literally the going out of business strategy. This is a kind of a different take on failure. But I want people to understand that not all failures are recovered. That's why we end up paying things like the price to implement a complicated protocol such as Paxos. So what are we going to talk about? 
Well, Paxos is just this particular implementation of quorum, uh, quorum consensus. In some ways, we simplify things. Everybody gets one vote. In some ways, we make things a little more complicated. Now we have learners, and we have proposers, and we have acceptors. So we have more roles. But in essence, acceptors are kind of like readers, and proposers are, are, are writers. And it's, it's a slightly different take, but it's ultimately trying to accomplish the same thing, which is we are trying to come up with a mechanism or a model for distributing the information in a way that the failure of one or more nodes will not cause us to fail, the system to fail. A computer can come and go. Somebody reboots the server, it comes back. That's fine. We can reason about that. We can lose connectivity between our data centers. We can reason about that. So we're going to talk about that. I'm just going to review transactional commit. I didn't really talk about three-phase commit before because I don't actually think it's super important. Um, it's an asynchronous version of two-phase commit which makes things more complicated, but it's the same exact outcome. And then we're going to talk about Paxos, because that's really what we're at after. Again, this is about consensus. So in our consensus model, you may recall that we said the only things we can choose as outcomes are things that are proposed by participants. And that's definitely true in Paxos as well. Um, we haven't talked too much about liveness, but we've talked a little bit about it. So how do we know that the system isn't caught in an infinite loop? How do we know that your search test doesn't time out? I mean, effectively, the idea in the search tests was, do you actually make decisions, or do you just sit there and talk about it? You know, it's you and your friends trying to figure out what to eat tonight. Eventually, somebody just makes a decision and goes with it. So there's liveness there. Because, of course, if you didn't ever make a decision and therefore you just kept arguing about what you were going to eat, eventually you would die. And so that's an important process, uh, important outcome here. Um, and so it's interesting that one way to look at FLP is it says, look, you can't have both a 100% guarantee and 100% liveness guarantee. So liveness versus safety, you have to pick one. This was Aurora. We picked availability over consistency. We picked liveness over safety. This isn't a binary decision. That's what makes this field interesting. This is often a decision of how much am I willing to tolerate in terms of lack of safety. I mean, maybe you're really good at like doing you know, acrobatic acts on a on a, a wire between all things. Uh, have you ever seen Cirque du Soleil? The stuff they do is just absolutely mind-numbingly amazing. And the first time I went and watched O, oh, and they're diving off of these tall pillars into things that a moment ago were floor. I mean, that certainly didn't feel very safe to me, but. Obviously, they, they do it. Um, so maybe that's your level of safety. Me, I want a nice net underneath me so that when I actually stumble and fall, I get caught. And in fact, they actually mostly practice with those kinds of nets because people do stumble and fall. And occasionally, they have accidents. In distributed systems, occasionally things are going to go wrong, really, really wrong. Backups are our safety net. Rackspace's backups didn't work right. So two-phase commit, just to review, um, two-phase commit is, does not guarantee liveness because we, we block. Um, if the coordinator goes away, we block. We, we don't make any for, forward progress on it. Very straightforward. Now we start trying to, to frame it in the same language we're going to be using as we start talking about Paxos. So we have a coordinator, and the coordinator interacts with the other nodes, and when 
when we're done with the transaction, the coordinator asks those nodes to be prepared to commit the transaction. They say yes. It's it, in this case, our quorum is 100%. Right? We started off with a really simple quorum model: all or nothing. And we're going to keep. We've kind of started shimmying away from that because the problem with all or nothing is it sacrifices liveness for safety. Well, once everybody's voted, the coordinator counts the votes, basically. When everybody says yes, then the coordinator puts it in its log. It says, yes, okay, this transaction has happened. And then it tells everybody else what the outcome of that transaction was. And of course, now we can deal with some levels of failure because if the if one of the uh, participants in the transaction fails and comes back up, it can ask the coordinator, what was the outcome of that transaction? So we could reason about that. We had a clear model for how to deal with that kind of failure. Three-phase commit just makes things a little bit looser. Like I said, it now becomes asynchronous. Um, it's still, is just, it's very similar to two-phase commit. It's just that instead of doing all of the um, and you commits at the same time, it can do them out of sequence with each other. So in other words, I talk to you, I ask you if you're ready to roll forward, and then I talk to you, and I ask you if you're ready to roll forward. So I'm kind of interleaving things here slightly differently. It's a little more flexible that way. And sometimes that's good for building parallel performance. But in the end, the coordinator makes a decision and tells everybody what the outcome is. So from that perspective, it's exactly the same. And once the outcome has been determined by the coordinator, two-phase commit and three-phase commit have the same recovery model. And that is, if you don't know what the outcome of the transaction was, you go ask the coordinator. Very straightforward. If you get into a situation where something has gone wrong that you can't handle, you stop. You're a database, you're a database, you're a database. You are prepared to make an update, you're prepared to make an update, you're prepared to make an update. And then I say, okay, I'm gonna make a commit decision, but you crashed. And we had to restore you from backup, last week's backup. So even though you committed that transaction and you crashed, you violated your agreement and therefore, we are no longer in a correct state. We've lost our consistency. And that's what we call the fail stop. You know, fail stop means I just give up, I quit. What we really want is fail restart, which is you come back up, you didn't crash, you have a log, you come back up, you replay your log, you ask the coordinator what happened, you fix your database, and now everything is good. That's actually what we want. We want to be able to fix things in an automated fashion. But there are always going to be failure cases we cannot restore from, and in which case then you stop. Why did we stop in project three if we had no backup and the primary went away? We don't even know how to get back there. We can't pull some other random server in and say, yo, you, Mr. Database, you haven't actually been participating in any of this stuff here. You start answering those client questions. The fact that you have nothing in your database, why would that be bad? The client who thinks that you've got keys in your key value store is suddenly going, okay, I need to get, get, get me this key. And you go, um, I don't have that key. So a lot of what we're talking about isn't necessarily the individual nodes, but rather the state of the system services. So I have a service. I have a key value store that I'm actually serving to clients. I can't just simply dump the entire database, choose some random server, and say, you're now in charge. Because I've violated the guarantees I'm giving to the client. Bad things happen. Don't keep going. See, if I keep going, what I risk doing is making that client think that I can continue safely. Because a client is trusting me. Oh, sorry. Well, you know, hey, it's the wrong data, but I gave you something. So that's the, that's the extreme. I sacrifice all safety for liveness. I'm always going to be alive. I'm always going to answer your queries, even if I give you the wrong information. Well, that's pretty useless.
you can't really reason about that either. If you're writing an application and the database goes away and then just starts giving you garbage, you can't really do anything useful with that. Paxos is, in fact, a lovely place. Um, I've had this picture for a while because I grabbed that picture. It is, in fact, a clock on the island of Paxos, which I thought was very appropriate given that Lamport gave us both Lamport clocks and Paxos. Um, you can go and search and you can find beautiful little travel brochures and whatnot. So if you ever feel like you want to have a nice vacation someplace, you can go to Paxos. And Paxos is um, on the western side of Greece. So if you go across the water, you'll hit, you'll hit uh, southern Italy. And lovely place. I grabbed the picture of it, it off of Google Maps. I was like, oh, yeah, so you can actually see this isn't an imaginary place. I have no idea why Lamport chose Paxos. It's clear the man has a very interesting mind. Um, the eight years it took to publish the Paxos paper apparently were only dwarfed by one of his other papers that took 25 years. So the title of that paper is The Part-Time Parliament. He literally submitted it in 1990, and it was actually published and accepted in 1998. Same paper, even though they had rejected it in 1990. It describes a mythical Greek legislature and their system of asynchronous consensus. And he has, what is it, olive tree contracts and synods and Greek legislators and you're like, wow. But what he describes is actually a very simple protocol. And when he rewrote the paper called, uh, I think it's Paxos Simplified or Paxos Revisited or something, he literally takes all this stuff out and, and his comment was, okay, it's the same exact algorithm, it's the same exact story, I just took all of the interesting some, you know, uh, stuff around it and the math in it is no harder than, uh, what is it, N1 greater than N2. And as you walk through it, I think you'll say, wow, it is actually pretty easy. It's still a bitch to implement correctly. But the algorithm itself is pretty easy. So the Paxon Parliament, um, there's interesting things around Greek when you translate the word Paxos on precisely how it sounds. So they use both of them in different places. We have a parliament that passes decrees. These are the decisions that the parliament makes. They only work part-time. Not everybody's in the same office at the same time. And yet they need to communicate with each other. So they use messages. They like leave little post-it notes. Probably stone tablets, but um, they leave little post-it notes. The messages are not guaranteed because they can be delayed. Uh, they can not be sent at all, like you abstain from the vote. Sorry, I'm too busy. I'm not going to vote on that today. It's like when I ask people, you know, a yes, no question, and three of the students raise their hands for yes, and two raise their hands for no, and the rest of you abstain. You've got to figure it, that's going to happen. And there are no malicious actors. So we're going to remove the Byzantine case here. Now, we will come back and we will find that we can actually make the Byzantine case work with Paxos. It just is harder. So the rules of Paxos are that our algorithm specifies a state machine. The state machine model is extremely useful when we reason about distributed consensus protocols because it fits what we are doing very well. That is, we have messages. The messages trigger state changes. Remember when we were doing consistent cuts? The reason that works is because we have a state machine model. It's very easy to reason about. The reason that we can build a discrete event simulator so you can be tortured implementing projects three, four, and five is because it's a state machine. I mean, a discrete event simulator doesn't actually have multiple threads. It doesn't, it, it, it just has a single queue of messages and when they're going to be delivered. We can make it somewhat random by choosing to throw messages away and the tests do that. I mean, how many of you actually looked at the test framework? Anybody? Most people are going to abstain, of course. So you kind of looked at it, and your eyes glazed over and said, I don't want to spend time to figure this out. I just want to get this project done and move on, because I've got three midterms to study for, and um, 
And, and, and we have to decide on what to have for dinner tonight. You got to have priorities, right? Or where, where am I going? You could be going to Paxos for reading break. What a perfect place to sit there and enjoy the sun off the coast of Greece and not study Paxos. Perfect. Um, so, we have a state machine. We have events, those messages that change the states of our machine. Our consistency model is that only things that were proposed can actually be outcomes. In other words, if you do a put and you do a put, the only thing you can find in that key is one of those two values. I don't come up with some other value and stick it there. Now, of course, when you go, well, but what about append? Append kind of becomes the, the ordering in which things happen, but both pieces are there. Everybody eventually agrees on a single value. We don't all have to agree at any instant in time. But we have a protocol for breaking ties. So for example, if you think the answer is one, and you think the answer is one, and you think the answer is two, it's one. But now you change your mind because you've, your state has changed because you've now got a message. Now it's two. Well, it's two, two, and one, so now it's two. So it's that quorum. The quorum defines what the collective says the value is, and that can change as the messages continue to flow through the system and the state changes. The participants only find out that a value is chosen once we know that value has been chosen. In other words, one, one, two, we learn about one, even if we're in the process of transitioning to two. Now when it's two, two, one, that's the durable decision now. We're not going to roll backwards. And I remember I talked about eventual consistency models. In the eventual consistency models, one of the weird things there is we've relaxed that requirement. We're not doing that in Paxos. Not yet. Paxos is still trying to be on the strong side, the safe side, rather than the live side. So Paxos, as written by Lamport, does not guarantee liveness. It guarantees safety. Um, and in fact, the paper is actually a formal proof that this algorithm that he lays out functions properly and you always get consistent decisions. In 2001, Lamport updated the paper. Paxos made simple. He doesn't have a Greek parliament. He doesn't have all the three price agreements. He doesn't have synods. We've sucked all the fun out of it. Now it's just another academic paper. In Paxos Made Simple, it's the same model. We have the same asynchronous messaging. We have the same assumption that there are no Byzantine actors. We have the same assumption that messages can take as long as they need to. Um, we have the same assumption that an agent can fail. We have the same assumption that an agent can restart after a failure. You reboot your computer. I mean, it wouldn't be very realistic if we only built models that worked as long as we didn't reboot our computers. Uh, in 2000, I went to a workshop that was, I think it was sponsored by the US Department of Energy, and it was called the Scalable Global Parallel File System Workshop. And I knew a fair number of the people there. The FS Geek thing actually is because I've been doing file systems for a long time. And one of the people there, who I still know um, pretty well, is you went on after that and built a file system called Luster, which is a parallel distributed file system that's supposed to be able to handle very large files and also supposed to be able to handle very large numbers of files. So it was, it was built for this massive scalability. And there's a couple of these now. Um, Luster is still around. Uh, he started a company. He sold the company to Sun. He left. Sun was acquired by Oracle, and Oracle then kind of screwed the project over. 
The luster is still around, but I don't think Oracle does anything. Stuff happens. But one of the things I remember from that workshop was when one of the speakers talked about the fact that, that they had a sun, a cluster of sun workstations, 128 of them. Each of them had 40 attached hard drives. And the longest they had been able to get everything up and running at the same time was 18 minutes. You can see why having a model where you require that nothing be failing isn't very scalable. Gee, for 18 minutes, we were actually able to do our job. Yuck. Failure is an inherent part of our models. We have to be able to handle something going away permanently. We have to be able to handle something going away temporarily. We can't actually tell the difference between these two, since you might permanently be going away, or you might temporarily, but we won't know until you come back, and that's just a halting problem in different clothing. How long before that computer gets restored? Who knows? It never will. And the Vogons destroyed the Earth, so they had to go find the planet building. Does anybody know the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy story? It's actually very amusing, right? So they blew up the planet five minutes before. This was a, the Earth was built as a computer to answer the question to life, the universe, and everything. They blew it up five minutes before this English dude, Arthur Dent, escapes the planet and then ends up getting sucked into this whole thing where they have to travel to this, this other place where they build planets. So they have to bring the, build, the planet building people out of stasis because there's been a recession in planet building for you know, a billion years or something. Um, and so they, they, they rebuild the Earth so they can actually complete the computation. And the reason that it happens is because um, the mice have been running an experiment on planet Earth. And they're the ones who paid for the construction. Which, of course, is the whole funny thing, right? You know, because we mice into like, we test them. And instead, they were really running the whole show. Um, it's, it's very amusing, and it's very British, and it's very funny. But there's also a lot of interesting ways of looking at things there. Um, I don't know why that was funny at the time, but we're never coming back from the Vogons destroying the Earth, except we go and get the planet building people, and we actually do restore the backup from Arthur Dent's brain. So in fact, it did eventually recover. Kind of an extreme example of that. Can't make any, we can't reason about that, so fine. Agents may recover from failure, but they may not. We have to be able to handle either of those cases. If you never recover from the failures, then we're going to have to adapt to that. If we get too many failures, eventually we're going to reach a point where we stop being alive. And that's why we can't guarantee liveness in this system. Because we could have enough nodes fail that we'll never be able to achieve a workable consensus. At that stage, somebody has to call the, the, the system rebuilder people in, and they're going to have to fix things. We cannot fix all these problems automatically. Messages are unreliable. They have arbitrarily long delivery delays. We're back to FLP again. They can be duplicated. This is why we have AMO semantics. Uh, they can be lost. This is why we retransmit, which is why we need AMO semantics. So you see how we solve one problem, the lost packet problem, and create a new problem, which is the duplicated packet problem. We don't guarantee any ordering, but we do assume that there is no message corruption. So we have ways of making sure that the messages we get are, in fact, the messages that were sent. So messages are at least quantized. We get all the message or none of the message. So what are the key ideas here? A key idea here is state machine replication, which is the idea that each of the nodes in our system implements the same state machine. Well, gosh, that's exactly what we do in our discrete event simulator for projects three, four, and five, isn't it? Because we really only have one state machine, and we just run it. We run it in multiple nodes inside of a single-threaded process on on a computer. In the real world, where we're running it on actual different computers, we run it. We want to have the same state machine. If you start thinking about it, you'll realize that if the state machines aren't identical, we aren't going to be able to reason about this very easily. 
Sounds like a really good theory area. If any of you are very interested in just uh, distributed consensus protocols, you could say, well, could we have different state machines? What could we say about them? Maybe we have two state machines, and we're, you pick one or the other. I don't know. Maybe you can make that work. But for our purposes, and in Paxos, we're going to assume everybody has the exact same state machine model of the universe. We are going to use a simple voting algorithm here. All of the voters have one vote. So it's easy for us to reason about. When we looked at Gifford's work in quorum, uh, quorum replication, he allowed us to, to have different numbers of votes. I then went and recast it as weights, which is the same thing, just instead of doing quantized multiples of um, natural numbers, you have actually um, integers. You have, uh, you know, you have real numbers. Doesn't matter. Same thing. Works out exactly this. The idea behind a quorum is that if it's any structure, and this is why crumbling walls was interesting, is any structure where there's no other way for me to take a subset and come up with a quorum. There could only be one quorum. And that's why Crumbling Waltz was really interesting. It managed to achieve quorum consensus without a majority quorum. Maybe you can see why that could be powerful. I don't have to get everybody to agree. I just have to get the right set of people to agree so that no one else can come up with a different outcome. That's all it requires for us to provide our safety guarantee. In our case, this majority quorum mechanism that we're choosing is what allows us to do the handle fail restart. Nodes can go away and they can come back. But it doesn't matter because the quorum isn't based on the number of nodes that are alive right now. It's based on the total number of nodes in the system. Question in the back. In these systems, yes, they actually start off with an assumption that the, that the number of nodes is actually known. You can relax that, but it makes the analysis a lot more complicated. Because if you, if you start thinking about it, you can actually get to a point where, the system, where you have a, a large system and it's in a safe spot, and then you adjust the number of nodes, and then you can reason about it again. But it doesn't add anything to the conversation at this point. When we start looking at the sharded key value store, this is one of the things that makes the Project 5 an absolute beast. You can change the number of shards, which is, in essence, changing the number of nodes that are participating. No, it's not even in essence. It is. You are changing the number of nodes that participate. And it just kicks this thing up, which is already really complicated. It kicks this thing up on steroids. This is a great question. We're just trying to make things simple. So we, we're trying to get you to be able to walk before you um, can self-propel yourself to Alpha Centauri. Just, that's probably not quite a fair comparison. It's probably easier to get to Alpha Centauri on your own power. We have ordering. Everything has a timestamp in it so we can be ordered. We know that we can put timestamps in things. Um, It'll be interesting to see how he, how Lamport, who gave us Lamport clocks, will give us timestamps in this new system. It, it's, it's clever. We have to have that ordering so we can tolerate the arbitrary message delays. We have to be able to deal with out of order events. And in essence, what he ends up using is a very interesting implementation of a vector clock. Axos has multiple phases. We have a prepare phase. This is where there are some nodes that um, propose an agreement. This is what I think the value of that key should be. And then we have the voters, what we call the acceptors, and they vote. Do I accept your proposal or not? It's an up-down, that's it. Very simple, very easy. Once we have a decision, we have the learners. And the learners 
are kind of like our clients. Now we can make this visible to you because we have agreed internally on what the outcome of this, of this decision was. And we're not going to change our minds. We might have a future decision that reverses it, but we're not going to change our minds about this particular decision. And then the learners are the nodes that can learn about what the outcome of the, of the actual decision was. Interestingly enough, this can be done with just two rounds of messages. So it's not even an inefficient protocol. The proposal number is an inherent part of the message because this is what allows us to be able to handle fail restart and out of order delayed messages. Okay, so now let's go, go through this in a little greater detail. In the first phase, this is our prepare phase, we have a leader. And the leader is one of the nodes that is suggesting, they're making a proposal, they are suggesting that a value be set to something. So this is the outcome of this operation. A put on a key. I'm going to suggest this key now has this value. The leader selects a value n. n is from a totally ordered set of values across all of the nodes. And the way that we do this, and this is why we need to know how many of these things there are, the way that we do this is we basically just split up the integers so that if there are three of us, I'll take zero, you take one, you get two. I get three, you get four, you get five. I get six, you get seven, you get eight. I mean, you can come up with a different algorithm if you really want. It's fine. The point is, though, none of us are ever going to use the same value. And there's an order. So when I look at the values that are coming from us each, I can decide which one is biggest. And I'm only ever going to roll forward to the highest numbered proposal that I've seen. So our leader has a value that it's going to propose and a message number that it has never used before and will never use again, where never could mean a short period of time, but you know, the real world's definition of never versus the mathematical definition of never. Um, and I send a prepare request. Got this information built into it. That has to go to enough of the voting nodes, the acceptors, that I can achieve a quorum. If there are 400 voting nodes, I need 201 of them. 200 is not enough. 201. When an acceptor receives a proposal, it looks to see if the number of that proposal is larger than any proposal it has seen before. And if it hasn't seen any proposals with a larger number, it now basically says, okay, I'm willing to ignore all of the proposals with a number below yours. And this is going to, ha going to be how we deal with out-of-order messages. Because the highest number is going to win. It also, and this is the good part, it also sends back the message number of the highest proposal it has seen previous to this. This is kind of a, a backdoor way of giving us a consistent cut. Never really thought about it that way until I'm sitting here explaining that and going, whoa, okay. So now I know what the state was previously that I've seen. And I can tell that to the proposer, the leader. So let's walk through that with some pictures, which I've conveniently stolen. So we have a proposer. And our key def value default is foo. So we're doing a put. The proposer sends a prepare to all the acceptors. As long as enough of those acceptors are up for us to be able to form a quorum, life is good. I mean, if, if everybody's dead, we're not going to make any forward progress, and we have the liveness problem. Great. 
Got it. What do the acceptors do? Well, they actually need to respond. Now, in this case, there's nobody else proposing anything. So what they do is they say, I don't have anything I've actually seen. This is the first proposal that they've seen. They say, never seen anything before this. Life is good. If the proposer gets enough votes, we have a decision. We have an outcome. So in that second phase, the acceptors look and see if they're willing to accept this proposal. If they are willing to send this proposal, they're going to send an answer back to the leader. Um, so if the proposer receives enough responses for there to be a majority here, then you send an accept. Yes. No, 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 it's just a majority of the notes. I just said, I just reiterated the same statement. You don't have to actually do that. You can have proposers and acceptors separated from each other. You don't have to have them be, you don't have to be both a proposer and an acceptor. It is very common to implement it that way, but it's not a requirement. Yes. You need a majority of the acceptors. That's correct. To all of the acceptors that we know about, we don't know how many of them will receive the message, but we, will, we know who the acceptors are, and we send a message to all of them. That goes back to the question you were asking before, which is you know, the variable number, can these things change size? And the answer is, for our purposes here, no. We know who all the acceptors are, we know who all of the proposers are, and we know who all the listeners are up front. And that makes it simpler to reason about. It's not hard to, to go, okay, I think I can see how I might be able to change that dynamically later, but from, for now, it's easier for us to understand this as a fixed model. Question in the front. The acceptor's decision to vote yes is based upon whether or not the message number is greater than any previous proposal it has seen. Yes, that's exactly correct. That's what's guaranteeing us the ability to always move forward and not move backwards. I don't have to reason about what the ordering was of the things that happened in between message N and message N plus M. So you're not happy with that answer, or you want more? Well, I, okay, so if you want formally, that set can be anything, right? Um, I just simply chose the set of, um, of numbers from zero to infinity because I thought it was the easiest and most natural one to think about. Now, in fact, I, I actually spent some time going through and making sure that that, actually, that set actually worked, because it was a little harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, I might choose 1 to infinity instead of 0 to infinity, and I played with that for a while, too, because I might say that 0 is, in fact, how I indicate that I've never seen anything before. But then you realize it doesn't make any difference. You, you, you just need a symbol that says, I've never seen anything before, and then you need numbers that are ordered. And, and Lamport, who's a mathematician, of course, is saying it's an ordered set. And it's a disjoint ordered set, right? So each of the proposers owns a disjoint, or, or disjoint piece of that ordered set. So if I have two proposers, they have different message numbers. They can never collide. You can never get two messages with the same message number. That's what he was trying to guarantee. Question in the back. Oh. And we're going to go through it. I, have a, I actually have a picture coming up. Um, all right, so an acceptor receives um, an accept request for proposal N if it has not seen a higher number of proposal it accepts it. If it seems 
Okay, when an acceptor receives an accept request for a proposal, if it hasn't seen a higher number of proposal, it accepts it. If it has seen a higher number of proposal, it doesn't accept it, it drops it. It basically says, sorry, this is now an out of order operation. And the reason that becomes important, of course, is that if we have multiple proposers and they're each sending messages, we have to figure out how to arbitrate between them. We can only accept one of them. We can't accept two. Question in the front. This one? No. Correct. And I actually have a nice little picture that shows what happens when you get a conflict, a conflicting proposal between two different nodes. And maybe the graphical version of it is better. It doesn't actually matter. It can set, actually should, I think it should send it to all acceptors, right? Because even if you didn't vote for it, once we've achieved, once we've achieved quorum, I can still tell you what the outcome of the decision was. All right, so here's an example of our acceptors. Proposer sends a prepare. The acceptors all send back agree. This is a simple case. We really didn't have lots of simultaneous parallel uh, proposals. We just had one. And now we send a commit to the acceptors. We say, okay, I'm the leader. I've collected the votes. Here's the outcome of that. Now, once we have a consensus amongst the acceptors, so enough of the acceptors have received the commits to know that this transaction has now committed, we can tell the learners. This is when the value has been decided. The land port actually says you don't necessarily want to send a message to everybody in the whole world who wants to know about this. What you can probably do, what you can do, and this is essentially it's a proxy mechanism. It says, I'm going to take a few of you, I'm going to tell you what the outcome is, and you can tell everybody else what the outcome is. You don't have to do it that way. I mean, from a reasoning perspective, it's exactly the same way. It's, it's like I tell everybody all at once, or I tell a few uh, keyly placed learners, and they can tell the other learners about it. Fine. The point is, once the quorum has been achieved and they've accepted the commit message, now it becomes visible because now the quorum is visible. So when we did quorum, repl uh, quorum replication, we had to look in, and come up with some subset, some quorum that gave us the same value. We're doing the exact same thing here now. That's what the learners are doing. They are learning that there is now a quorum here. And therefore, this will never go backwards. This has been committed. That's our safety guarantee. Did you have a question in the back? OK. Let's make it a little bit more complicated. Um, Actually, this isn't the more complicated case yet. There's, this is the, the learner's case, right? So just like before, we had a proposal. We accepted it. We committed it. Um, now we have a decision. So the acceptors now actually have said, OK, I'm going to record this decision. Enough of them, once two, in this example, we've got three. Once two of them have recorded that decision, it's now it's now permanent, and we can tell the learners about it. So an acceptor that, that accepts a decision can tell the learners, I've accepted this decision. And that actually makes it easier for, easy for the learners to say, OK, I know how many nodes there are in the system. So once I've received a quorum of them, I'm done. Lots of edge cases, right? I'm, I'm hearing the questions, and they're, they're, they're exactly the right questions to be asking. Going, okay, this is great and hunky dory when everything is going exactly the way you want it to, with one proposal and a bunch of acceptors, and everything's flowing through the system naturally. But it gets a lot more interesting when we have two proposers, or n, or n is large integral prime and non even. If we have multiple proposals with different values, we can only choose one. 
And so we're always going to ignore the lower numbered proposal. That's going to be our tiebreaker. And that's what's actually interesting here. It's going to create its own problems. We'll have to address those as well. So let's suppose we have two proposers here. Proposer number two sends a message, a prepare message with message number two. Proposer number one sends a message with message number one. The acceptors get message two and they send their agrees back. Now we still are simplifying this a little bit because they could actually be receiving them in different orders and that's when things get lots of fun and that's what's going to make project four such a beast to implement. Okay, so what we wanted to talk about is when this prepare comes in, the acceptors go, wait a minute, that has message number one, but I've already accepted message two. So just drop it. Sorry, I'm not going to pay any attention to you. And now we get to commit that. And so we commit the message from proposer number two. And the value in our key is going to be R. Question in the back. The none just means we've never actually agreed to anything before this. That would be the highest number of proposal that you had previously agreed to. That is, in fact, exactly correct. So, and it will always be less than the message number of the Prepare, strictly less than. You're never going to have an accept, because you, you, you're never going to have a duplicate message, right? That was the guarantee we made by partitioning the set, was that we, would, we had an ordered set, we partitioned it so that each pro pro uh, proposer had its own set, and they will never reuse the same value. So your question is, let's suppose that the order, the, um, the preparer or the proposer actually sends the same prepare message twice, which we're allowed to do, and the acceptor receives that prepare message. Then, in fact, what the acceptor should do is send back the answer they sent the first time. It is AMO. Yes, once you, once you have a quorum and you, you tell the learners, it's done. You should never, ever see anything roll back to a, a state before that. Technically, it's once the quorum of the acceptors have. The learners are the ones who observe it. So the idea is that the learners learn after the acceptors have reached quorum. It's not the learners who... Well, because they don't actually know what the whole ledger looks like. In fact, the learners are kind of the ones who discover what the ledger looks like because they, they've received messages from enough of the acceptors to know that, okay, this is passed. Yeah, it's weird because the acceptors own the database and the learners are the ones that are aware of the state of the database. So it's not even like it's a single ledger, right? That's the trick here is that it's a distributed ledger and the learners figure out that there's enough copies of the distributed ledger that have the same outcome that now I know what the outcome is. So it's not like the learners are maintaining a ledger. The learners have learned of the state of the ledger even though there isn't a ledger. There's a lot of different ledgers. And they could, be, they could have a lot of different information in them, but the outcome of that particular proposal is now determined. I know, it's playing with your head, right? Because you, you, you want a ledger. You want a, a single place where this decision is recorded. 
Think about it more. Question in the front. You do not have a question. I thought you raised your hand. Sorry. Well, he has a question now. They choose one that's higher than the previous one they used. That's it. That's all they have to do. Correct. That was the whole reason I went through that annoying construction of, of disjoint ordered sets. I mean, it's kind of cool, right? It's, it's like we've, we've sort of created, well, no, we haven't even sort of. We've, we've essentially created this vector clock that can never have collisions on any of the clock values. And therefore, we can just use the highest numbered element in the vector. That's a different way of thinking about it. Each node gets its own number, and you just simply scan through that, and you take the max number, and that's the current proposal number. Question? So, if the preparer, if the preparer sends the same prepare request or the, sends the same proposal, uh, the, if the proposer sends the same prepare message, again, the acceptor should send back the same response. Yes. If you change anything, it wouldn't be the same response. So the answer is yes, including the highest number it had seen to that up to that point. You don't. You just have to, right, exactly. You have to keep doing it, yes, until you get an, uh, you get an answer. I mean, what, what's normally going to happen is that you're not going to get an infinite number of packet losses. But if you do, because you're partitioned off from the network, you're just going to keep sending it every so often. Go, ah, hello, hello, hello. And then, you know, tomorrow you come in and realize that somebody unplugged the Ethernet cable, you plug it back in, and suddenly the message gets delivered, at which point then um, that acceptor says, yeah, that's great, this is what I told you. But, but you didn't get a quorum, and so therefore... There's going to be some other acceptor who's going to go, screw you. I've never seen, I've never sent you a response to this message, so um, we've moved on. At which point you're going to have to actually abandon it. Correct. Actually, no, that's... Um, uh, let's see. Why does he do that? Uh, good question. I don't know. I'm going to have to go look at that and see exactly what we do in that particular instance. Um, good question. So how does the original proposer know that his proposal has not been accepted? Um, there are at least, there is at least one node that has not answered him yet. Otherwise, he would have had a, had a quorum, right? So there's some subset that hasn't answered him yet. If that n subset, that subset has to be large enough that he doesn't have quorum. That's kind of the point. So therefore, there will eventually be somebody he asks who says, no, sorry, I, I've accepted a, a higher number. And therefore, now he has to drop that proposal. He never actually sends a commit on that proposal. He instead now proposes a new value. That's why it works. Yeah, right. So you get a new command with a different number on it from, from the proposer. The old command is dead. We don't care. Question in the back. It's the highest numbered one, so now I'm going to accept it. What that means is that when, when, they, when proposer one sends his, um, when proposer one sends his commit, I'm going to drop it. And eventually he's going to learn about that because somebody in the system hadn't prepared at that point. 
and therefore we'll send him a prepare that says, sorry, I saw a larger numbered message. That was, in fact, the sequence we just walked through. Yes, I know, it's, it's a little weird to think about that. Okay, so half, you know, less than half of the, of the nodes, the acceptors, have said they've accepted my, my proposal. But then somebody else comes along and says, no, I'm sorry, I can't accept your proposal. My proposal is now dead. I'm never going to send out the commit. That's how I figure out that somebody, somebody else came along. Acceptors, so if I've already sent back an accept, all I can do is send back that accept. And this is how I'm going to deal with, you know, uh, fail restart and, and lost messages and reordered messages and whatnot. But if, I'm, if I am an acceptor and I get a prepare a proposal, yeah, prepare, I get a, a prepare that I've not seen before, but I've seen a higher number, I'm going to send him back a message that says, I can't accept this because I've seen a higher number. Drops it, yes. Right, because I always send, when I send back my response, I'm going to send back, this is the highest number I've seen. And then that way, the proposer is going to know that somebody else has a more recent proposal, and therefore I cannot, I cannot commit. Because I didn't get a quorum. You're not happy with this. Correct. You, tr you abort your transaction, basically. Sorry? Yep. We're going to get there. Probably not in this lecture, but I will do it in the post-recording, because, in fact, that is an interesting problem. How do you know that you're going to have liveness? And remember, Paxos doesn't guarantee liveness. But you can actually end up in a situation where we have these dueling proposals back and forth and we never converge. And the way that we get out of that is we add a little bit of randomness to the system. And that's how we get out of it in the real world. In terms of, an act, of a formal proof, remember, liveness wasn't a requirement. And that's, in fact, exactly the slide. And since it's quarter after, I'm going to wrap it here. There's not a lot more slides, but I will actually, so I'll do my usual thing of recording, you know, the last 10 or 15 minutes of it. But this is really important. I mean, it's really interesting to walk through this thing and to say, it doesn't sound all that difficult. But then you start looking at the edge cases and you look at the, at, at the wow, I just throw those messages away and eventually, I guess, the preparer will figure it out. Maybe uh, you end up with this liveness problem, which is we have dueling proposals. The actual solution in the real world is we just randomize the amount of time before we uh, send our proposals. So one of us will actually win. And the idea is that if you keep randomizing, and this randomization is a very common solution. In, in systems where we don't turn all the VMs on at exactly the same time, otherwise everybody grinds to a halt, what we do is we randomize the start times so that first this one spins up and then 20 seconds later another one spins up and 20 seconds after that another one, and we can randomize those, which will lead to different bugs, but that's the real world, not this theoretical world. So I'm going to end here, and I will finish this up uh, later today. There is office hours at 1. Um, I, I need to put a post on Piazza because if you're planning on coming late, just let me know. Otherwise, I don't usually hang out until 2 o'clock on Zoom. It feels kind of weird, very oddly, because I'm recording it, right? And so it's sort of weird to sit there and stare at the screen and go, da -de -da -de -da. Um, so just, just drop a note in on Piazza and I'll, that way I'll know. All right. I will see everybody on...